assist when the minister is not there. The second and last question I have is, can you account for the increases in fuel prices beyond the reach of Ghanaians? Ah, is it not beyond the reach of Ghanaians? Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I get the question one more time? Okay. Well, can you give me the price buildup of fuel prices and, and, and why, why it has become this expensive? Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the, the price buildup of petroleum products has been evolving over a certain period of time. Over time, you find that there were some levies and margins in the price buildup. As we speak, some of those levies and margins are no longer there. For instance, we used to have the exploration levy. It's no longer in there. We used to have the excise duty. That is also not there. And then um, we had 17.5% of the special petroleum tax reduced to 15%. Later on, it was made a specific tax and so on. So different dynamics, you know, account for the price of petroleum products. Uh, so it depends on the fiscal policy of the government. Um, that's uh, the price of petroleum products is determined. Three things determine the price as we speak. Since July 2015, uh, the downstream industry was deregulated with no more government subsidies in terms of the price of petroleum products. So the price of the commodity on the international market is one determinant. Second determinant is the forex rates. And then the, the third one is the taxes, levies, and margins. The first indicator, the government really has no control, which is the price on the international markets. Forex government has some you know, interventions to make in that area. The third one, which is the taxes, levies, and margin. That's where the government intervenes. And um, some would go to the same industry players. For instance, there is a margin called the Unified Petroleum Price Fund, which is used to equalize the price of petroleum products so that regardless of which part of the country you are, the price is the same in Accra as it will be in Kulungugu or, uh, you know, Baku or Hamile or anywhere for that matter. So that is used to equalize the price. So it is paid to the oil marketing company uh, to compensate for the freight costs. The other one is the primary distribution margin. The primary distribution margin is used to pay for the freight of movement of the product from the coastal depot to the inland depots of Kumasi, Bupe, and Boga, Tanga. Now that is paid to bust to pay to the, to the owners of the tankers who leave the product on behalf. So the money comes in and then boss will submit an invoice, vetted and then it is paid to boss and they will in turn pay to the transporters. Then you have the fuel marking margin which was introduced in 2012 uh, to check for the quality and purity of the petroleum product. So it's a chemical, um, biochemical that is inserted into the product. That is also a margin that is in the price board up. Then you have the dealer's and marketing margin. The dealer's margin, so for instance, if the honorable member for Baku has, has a retail outlet anyway, so you are the dealer, and then you are riding on the back of an OMC. So the OMC is entitled to a margin, and then the dealer is also entitled to a margin in the price buildup. They charge and then they keep that money with them. The rest of them will be the road fund levy, energy fund levy, price stabilization and recovery levy. Uh, because we are operating in a deregulated environment, the price stabilization levy is used to pay under recoveries for premix and then residual fuel oil. Now, basically, these are, and then you have the special petroleum tax and so on and so forth. So all these margins have specific things that they go to pay for. And the only thing that government can probably intervene much will be the, the ones that are paid to the Ghana Revenue Authority. And I believe by and large, government has intervened reasonably to cushion the impact of some of these. But for the impact of COVID, I'm sure the sanitation levy and then 
all these levies wouldn't have come and prices would have reduced. Um, Mr. Chairman, bear in mind that the price of petroleum products reduced um, by 7% uh, from 2019 to 2020. We would have probably had a, a, a much reduced price by now. And I believe government is doing its best to, to cushion the, the impact of uh, price of petroleum products. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, are you done? Very well. Chairman, uh, did I hear the nominee uh, report to this committee that you've been chief executive of the National Petroleum Authority? That is so, Mr. Chairman. From which period to which period? Mr. Chairman, I've been chief executive from January 2017 <clears throat> until um, sometime in April when I finally, you know, um, signed off at the MPA. There was some Are you responsible for the day-to-day -day administration of the MPA? Are you saying you are responsible for the day-to-day -day management and administration of the MPA having been elected member of parliament? Not exactly, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, there was some transitional arrangements because I didn't have any deputy, so I was just taking through the plan transition, but I'm no longer in charge. I haven't been to the office <laughs> for, for a very long time now. So. Thank you. To, no, to the Honorable Ayaragai's question, how much is a gallon of petrol selling, export price, how much? Mr. Chairman, we do not have a uniform price, but the prices vary. Um, there are variations the, from Goya to Tota to your... So Goya, for instance, is selling at six cities, um, uh, 6.05 pesos. Um, Vivo is selling also at the same price. Puma is selling at about 6 CD, 6 That's okay. Pesos. Do you remember what the price was at December 2016? Thank you, Chair. As at January 7, the price was almost 4 Ghana cities. 4 Ghana cities? Almost 4 Ghana What accounts for the tax component of the price of petroleum product. Do you know the percentage of taxes on it? Thank you, Chair. Presently, the tax component is about 40%. As of January 2017, so 39% thereabouts. So, Chairman, to the nominee, it's a statement of fact that Ghanaians are paying more for petrol today than they were paying as of December 2016. Is that right? Mr. Chairman, that is correct. And, um, Thank you very much. Did you inherit any legacy debt? There was talk about debt of BDCs at the time of handing over at the MPA. Were there any outstanding burdens owed by the state to the bulk oil distributing companies? Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, the BDC debts were fully settled by the government as of 31st January 2020. And then the Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors issued a statement to that effect in February 2020 to um, acknowledge that fact and also to thank all the relevant players who made it possible. Over one Will you thank one President Mahama and the NDC for bringing in ESLA since I know for a fact that much of it was settled with accrual from the energy sector levy? Will you accept that? Mr. Chairman, like, like I said, the statement that was issued by Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors went beyond even uh, thanking the former President Mahama. He thanked the NDC government, he thanked the finance minister then, said Tekpe, he thanked almost Are all you aware parties. that your government has borrowed against the ESLA receivables? Mr. Chairman, yes indeed, it's, that is the case. Um, I think that this particular arrangement I'll call it a municipal bond. So it's not one of those general obligation bonds. So it's ring fence, and so it gives a lot of comfort to investors who want to invest in the bonds so that the monies are immediately, you know, paid to them to um, kind of offsets for the bond that were issued. So indeed. Well, well, Jama, we'll come to the arithmetics of it. You see, with ESLA, you had consolidation of taxes, and you had receivables, which was anticipated and would have known how much ESLA, for instance, uh, I've also referred to my copy of the budget statement of the projections of ESLA 2020-2021, enormous amount of money coming into it. 
which could be used because as you may be aware the balance sheet of ECG grid co VRA uh, in my view is still not the best is that known to you thank you chair Mr. Chairman, I will not be in the position to know the balance sheets of ECG VRA. Chairman, when the nominee was responding to the Honorable Yaga, he used Bokwe and Kulungugu. Does the cross subsidy of the petroleum build up also benefit people from Zinundo, Gushogu, and uh, Mahon Village, Yendi? Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, it does. It does. It affects the whole country. Chairman, now to subject matter, uh, President John Dramani Mahama initiated the expansion of the Kumasi Airport, initiated the expansion of the Tamale Airport against major criticisms at the time. You, I fly with you most of the time from Tamale, and you see a beautiful long runway. Uh, the intention was to expand it for purposes of people going to Hajj. My view is that the Tamale Airport should go beyond servicing Hajj, because you must situate it to serve the Sahelian region of Burkina Faso and uh, others. And again, I, 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 I recently was uh, on a flight with you. It is shorter if you have to take land in Tamale for many international routes. In the case of an air accident, you must have a safety zone for purpose of landing. You will be assisting the Honorable Minister for Transport. What plans are in your mind to the completion and expansion of the Tamale Airport and Kumasi? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, indeed. On uh, Monday, I was on the same flight with you uh, from Tamale. <laughs> and, um, Mr. Chairman, the works at the Tamale Airport, uh, that's a third phase, a second phase of the works at the Tamale Airport. Uh, is proceeding very steadily and I think that the plans that the Honorable Minority Leader has um, espoused are exactly what is in the handing over those that I peruse uh, on the Ministry of Av then Ministry of Aviation. The same applies to uh, the Kumasi Airport as well. The plans go beyond the use of the airport for the purposes of Hajj. I believe there's going to be um, an arrangement such that um, distressed aircraft can land in Tamale in the, when the need arises. And just to put it on record, I'm informed that, for instance, the runway in Tamale is a bit longer in terms of um, uh, its length than even the one in Accra, Kotoka International Airport. I, I've been told, but I stand for correction, though, Mr. Chairman. But I think that the plans that are in the books, quite uh, uh, frankly, is intended to make Ghana a petrol uh, was the name an uh, aviation hub in the West African sub-region. It's being pursued. Uh, Chairman, I say so because you see, if you situate Tamale Airport well for export of horticulturals, I see the Chairman of the Chamber, President of the National Chamber of Commerce, uh, supporting you morally. You can export using, for instance, if you take uh, the successful Ghanaian who does exports of fruits to Germany, he looks at the number of hours. Six hours he packages the fruit is in Frankfurt or in Dusseldorf for the purposes. Now, you are thinking that if you develop uh, on a Mustafa's uh, backyard between Nasir and Naboro, you find it, you send a business person to Tamale. And uh, again, the MPP government, your village there, Shene, around Yendi, you say you are going to do bauxite. There is no route to Shene. There is no railway to Shene. And you are giving people hope as if tomorrow the bauxite can be mined. That is problematic. So in Tamale, apart from Bupe, where you have a water source which will link us up to southern Ghana, your only opener is the Tamale Airport for purpose of export. Uh, this is not a question, Chairman, because I know your minister was in your village. Uh, he was in Yendi to meet Yana Bukare, who generously gave him some land for purpose of uh, expanding uh, the airport facility in that particular area. But again, when you come to Tamale Airport, the communities there, Pulenyang, Mbana, Yele, Buanayile, and others, 
the, 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 the thing that Ghana Civil Aviation is encroaching on their right. What would you do as an indigent to advise your minister to respect the right of original owners to the land whilst you expand the facility? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think, that, Mr. Chairman, this would call in aid um, Article 20 of the 1992 Constitution in terms of compulsory acquisition of land so that adequate and prompt compensation will be paid to the people, especially if the land is going to be used for the public interest and for the generality of the Ghanaian people, including the indigents of those communities. Then the government should go through the process of compulsory acquiring the land. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Honorable Patricia PJ. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations, Honorable Nomini. Thank you very who much. Who is also a member of this committee. We Thank are very, very proud of you. Thank uh, you. Honorable Nomini, there are actually reports of some petroleum products loading on the harbor, on our harbors, ostensibly to avoid payment of taxes. As Deputy Minister for the Transport Ministry, what will you, are you going to see to the complete seizure of this business? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, this has been uh, something that the National Petroleum Authority has been battling for some time now. And um, the, the downstream petroleum industry, when you fight and, and then you take your eye off the ball, they come back again. So I think that it has to be a consistent approach to dealing with that situation, putting everybody on notice and alerts. The National Security Operation, the Port Security, Navy, Marine, Police, um, the BNI and so on and so forth, all working together to ensure that that, um, that um, operations would abate. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask you a very sensitive question. I read from the social media that currently, I'm talking about motorcycle accidents. It's on the ascendancy. It used to be about 250 in a year and then currently, we are not, uh, we realize that motor accidents have risen from about 250 to about 1,050. What is your view on this Okada as a means of transport? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so the, the question is in two parts, the general accident, uh, um, accident situation and then the issue of Okada. So in terms of the general accident situation, I think that is a matter of utmost concern to all of us. Uh, and I believe recently um, this ministerial task force that was set up to deal with that matter uh, consists of Minister, Minister for Interior, uh, Minister for Roads and Highways, and Minister for Transport. I believe um, the Minister for Communications was at some point roped in to constitute the ministerial task force. Um, some meetings have been held, and one of the things that came out very strongly uh, from the information that I gather is the fact that the disabled and accidented vehicles that are normally parked on the shoulders of the road, it's one of the uh, serious cases that lead to some of these accidents. And then, of course, the narrowness of some of the roads, arterial roads from Accra to Kumasi, Takrade, and then a flower need some amount of dualization. So altogether, the Ministerial Task Force, I believe, will consider various options on the, the instrument of the National Road Safety Authority to bring about some recommendations that I believe would incorporate the National Insurance Commission and insurance companies so that we can all have, you know, very safe drive any time that we'll get to move on there, especially the highways. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, I was specifically asking about the Okada accident. That was what I, I mentioned, 250 to 1,050. The Okada, as a means of transport, it's a problem. It looks as if uh, we are having a number of accidents which are not necessary. And I was asking you, as a result of that, what is your view? 
on Okada as a means of transport. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I think that Okada uh, is when you commercialize the, the motorcycle as a means of transport. But we have been with the motorbikes for a very long time. It's a commercialization that I believe is the issue that, that, that is confronting us right now. The, the issue goes beyond the Okada. I think that generally motorcycle riders sometimes tend to indulge in some amount of rascality on the streets. You would agree with me that sometimes when you get to a traffic light, they do not, they do not respect the traffic lights, number one. You find that um, sometimes you have three or more people riding the same motorbikes, um, no helmets. So in the event of crash, you do not have any safety, you know, as far as the accident is concerned. So generally, government has to, currently, Okada is, uh, commercialization of motorbike is outlawed under the road traffic regulations. And I believe we should continue to maintain it for now until we get a lot more information or we are able to do a lot more public education about the use of the motorcycles as a means of transport before we can roll it out uh, easily. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I see an uh, honorable nominee as a very dynamic man, always up and doing. And uh, I really admire his vim when it comes to performance at anywhere you put it. Um, what new ideas do you have for the transport ministry, if I may ask? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and I appreciate the very kind words. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, working um, at, at the ministry requires that I assist the minister and for me to, you know, as uh, one of the advices, more or less, of the minister, we will have to share ideas and perspectives on some of the ways that we can best leave a legacy for the uh, Ghanaian people so that one day when he is no longer the minister, they will remember that it was during the Honorable Isiyama's time that all this happened. I believe when the history is being written, they would have noticed that I was one of his deputies at the time. So whatever support that I give to the minister, I believe that I tend to share in the glory when the <laughs> role is called. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, for, uh, uh, may I know, what about if you offer the advice that your minister doesn't think? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I believe that knowing the, the minister, I, I think that he's, he's, he's very flexible and he takes advice. Even if for somebody who hasn't gone through the, the process, sometimes he will call me for my I, I, you know, opinion on some of these matters, I believe. Anyway, Thank congratulations. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable Samziahi. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the Metro Mass Transport performs a very critical role in conveying people from one place to another. And uh, particularly with regards to the rural communities to market centers. But if you look at the fleet of vehicles that they have, you realize that most of them are very, very old. Those flying from Kumasi to Sahuyo, so Bodhi, that area, you realize that these are old vehicles that need to be replaced. What would be your attitude towards making sure that we get new vehicles to augment whatever they have now to ensure smooth transportation of people and goods from one place to another? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the Metro Mass Transit uh, Company it provides a social service that I believe um, requires that all of us have an interest in what they do. They do not charge, you know, lorry fares of school kids, I'm told, and then also persons who are considered senior citizens also do not pay lorry fare. Meanwhile, they buy the fuel at the same price as everybody will buy. So essentially they are subsidizing, but you don't get the, some support as far as the subsidy 
is concerned as you do in other areas nonetheless government has intervened i think many many times the last time i'm checking is that the government um, supported the minister for transport supported in getting them about 100 vehicles to augment their fleets i believe as more resources accrue to the government more more buses will be procured for them to be able to to provide the service that they are giving to um, uh, the Ghanaian people it's a very critical sector and a very critical company and i believe government will Augment the fleets. Thank you very much. Honourable Member, you raise a matter which is of interest to me. Say it is a social service. That's important. But does that mean that they can't operate to at least break even, such that they don't need to come back to government to buy them buses? They won't make profit. But at least generate enough to break even, so that when the bus is old, they can replace it on their own. Shouldn't that be the basis for pressure? Mr. Chairman, I agree with you 100%. I think that it's a matter of setting targets for, you know, the management of the company that they should come up with a plan of action that will take into account all these subsidies for school children and then, and, and then work out a certain workable arrangement that will make them uh, at least break even. So that those, those can be a, some matters of targets that will be given to management. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I'll you, please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, when we're growing up and going to school, we could use a train transport station from, for instance, Awaso to Takrade, even Kumase through Takwa to a secondary Takrade, carrying passengers, carrying bauxite carrying cocoa to the port. That is not the situation now. I understand government is working on trying to revamp the rail transportation. What are you going to do to support your minister to ensure that this aspect of, uh, I mean, the agency under your ministry is revamped to play their role to support transportation in the country. Very much. Mr. Chairman, that takes me back to the earlier question I just answered in terms of, you know, um, intracity. Intracity um, is normally done between um, uh, metro mass and then start the city to some towns. But intercity is serviced by the intercity STC. So all these ones, I think the intercity assist bus also was the beneficiary of a hundred buses uh, from the Minister for uh, Ministry of Transport. I believe it all comes back to the same augmentation of the, the fleet of vehicles to support. But we have to also recognize, Chairman, that the, the transport sector is, is a deregular, deregulated industry. So we have to support private people. Uh, for instance, the service that uh, VIP is providing to different parts of the country is one that cannot, you know, be overlooked. So whilst we are supporting the state-owned company, we should also be um, looking at supporting the, the private, you know, transport operators so that all together we'll be have, able to have, a, you know, um, a, a very e efficient transport sector in the country. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so before you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Honorable nominee, congratulations once more. Um, I, my question borders on management of public lorry stations. Um, I have observed from my constituency that a lot of these public lorry stations, which are supposed to serve the public good, tend to belong to some private individuals. And sometimes, even when you are making attempts to improve the station and, and make sure we have the basic amenities that would service the community, it becomes very difficult. What would be uh, your proposal, or what would you do to support your minister uh, to reclaim these public spaces for the communities so that we could improve them to improve the lives of our people. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It takes me again back to the question that was posed by the Honorable Minority Leader regarding the Tamale Airport area and then the impact of, of, of um, acquiring government lands. If the land that is in question, you know, belongs to the private uh, uh, individuals, and over a certain period of time, the place has been used as lorry park, um, some amount of expectation as far as the community is concerned would you know mean that that particular land is used to service you know the residents of those areas so the district assembly together with the lands commission you know can fashion out a mechanism for government to procure that particular piece of land and then lays with the ministry of transport for the construction of a lorry park to support you know those areas i believe there's one such park in Medina, uh, your constituency around the Zongo uh, Junction area, the Medina market. It's, it's one such good example. I, I buy cocoa from that area, so I know that area very well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Honorable Nominee. In fact, I was asking the question because of that very park. So since you've been buying cocoa from that park, um, would you be willing to follow up with us? Uh, because when you come to Medina, the Zongo Junction, we have a major issue there, where we have a park that uh, privately belonged to the, um, I think the Baptist School, but this has been used over the years for, I mean, lorry, as a lorry park. And we need to work to properly regularize our situation. Uh, if you would recall, in the past, it even led to some kind of uh, you know, disturbances, you know, shooting, and the young guys were, and I think we should be able to resolve this matter. And then also when you come to, I mean, um, the main lorry station in Medina, uh, when you get there now, the GPRTU, the Pro Tour, and the various transport associations are having uh, challenges because everyone is laying claim to some portion of that land. Uh, would you be willing, as a deputy minister, to work with us to regularize these matters in Medina? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I, would, I would refer to the minister, and I believe the minister will intervene to, to make, make, make it work. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My very final concern has to do with medical care for public drivers. Um, the last time we were on recess and I was doing the tour of the constituency and the various lorry stations, one of uh, my observation was that a lot of these lorry uh, truck trust drivers and their mates do not have regular medical checkup. And for most of the accidents that occur, uh, it stems from some, sometimes even emotional stress and some form of medical defect. What would you do to support your ministry to introduce a policy that will allow our public uh, drivers uh, to have some frequent or regular medical checkups? Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I would um, engage the minister, and I believe um, National Road Safety Authority would be you know, fully roped in to look into some of these things. Because they provide some training for some of these drivers, I believe it will not be too difficult to rope in the medical checks as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, so in first. I'll call, I'll give everybody. All right, um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, congratulations. The honorable much. nominee is a very good friend, an intelligent lawyer, and at the personal level, I'm disappointed he had to leave NPA to represent the people of Gushegu. <laughs> but it's good that you are here to serve your country in another capacity. Yes, even though I'm disappointed that he left NPA. Um, you and I come from an area where what's many people in Ghana call Okada, um, happens to be, in s most cases, the first and only mode of transport for our people. Also with that is yellow yellow, as it is affectionately known in our communities. 
other people call it aboboya and many other names keke and others those happen to be the only means of transport and it is in abundance and in use based on our experience what do you think about the current state of affairs where the operations are considered illegal thank you very much chairman i think that the you're right on points as far as the means of transport in the northern sector is concerned motorbikes bicycles and all of that but we do not as far as i remember use it as for commercial purposes normally you go pick somebody's bicycle or motorbike and then you take it to anywhere that you want but it's not something that we have been doing as far as the northern part of the country is concerned in, to commercialize the use of motorbikes nonetheless um it appears that is an emerging trend but since currently the law forbids it would have to go through the mechanism to get the law amended before we can you know actually allow uh, and, and make it and, and legalize it but for now under the road traffic regulation li 2180 of 2012 i believe it is unlawful for now thank you very much chairman all right thank you so it means that you are uh, for the possible uh, review of the law that will make it legal and maybe by extension yes people don't use it that much for commercial purposes in our area and that may also be the reason why there is a lot of unemployment with people unemployed people with who own motorbikes <laughs> that they could turn into a commercial venture but um, let's look at um, an answer to a question you uh, gave the minority leader about your tenure at NPA. You are a lawyer, Article 98.2 of the Constitution. It says, a member of parliament shall not hold any office of profit or emolument, whether private or public, and either directly or indirectly, unless permitted to do so by the speaker acting on the recommendations of a committee of parliament on the grounds that a holding that office will not prejudice the work of a member of parliament and b no conflict of interest arises or will arise as a result of the member holding that office now, honorable nominee given your experience at npa where the exigencies as you explained of the time uh, made it impossible for you to leave office even though you had been sworn in as member of parliament and I'm sure you had no permission from the speaker. What will be your advice to uh, governors? I mean, to uh, uh, us all, as, 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 as people operating within the governance space, in fine-tuning some of these laws that uh, will make it practicably, practicably, practicably possible for us to work within the law. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think first of all, uh, if you are going to occupy any uh, office that would entitle you to some profits or emolument as captured in the constitution, then you need to apply to the speaker for a certificate to be able to do so. Uh, one of the things that, that I believe informs that position is the fact that you need to give your full attention to your work as a member of parliament. So parliament should know what you are doing when you are not in the house in, in this instance i not too sure what the position would be if for instance you are you don't take any emolument or you don't you know take get any profit from that office which is the, the case that i i found myself in um so, but I believe as a house, we can fashion out Sorry, just, just for workable arrangements. Just for clarification, well. the provision actually doesn't talk about whether you take the emoluments or not. It simply says, any office of profit, a member of parliament shall not hold any office of profit or emoluments. So once it's an office of profit or emoluments, the question of whether you take it or not, uh, it's another 
matter. And my question is based on, you know, the answer you gave, that you continue to work at NPA even after you were sworn in as MP. Mr. Chairman, the, the, the provision in Article 98.2a, for instance, provides that holding that office will not prejudice the work of a member of parliament. That's A. And B, no conflict of interest uh, would arise as a result of the member holding that office. In other words, the clause A means that you should not be in that office in the one and that would not make it possible for you to be able to work as a member of parliament. In my case, for instance, out of 35 sittings in the first meeting of this parliament, I was absent only once. And on that occasion, I was on the peace mission with the Minister for National Security, the Honorable Member of Parliament for Karaga, and the then Chief Tenancy Minister um, on a peace mission in the Patanga issue. So all in all, I did not, and as a member of this committee, I'm sure you will bear testimony to the fact that I have not absented myself, not even once, as far as the sitting of this committee is concerned. So it's a matter of interpretation, I believe. Um, but like I said, as a house, we can put in place all the necessary mechanisms to operationalize all these provisions in the Constitution. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Right. Um, Honorable nominee, I'm, you the floor. I'm sorry. Okay. I've seen, um, just for my education, I've seen a couple of um, um, transactions um, to do with collections of margins and transfers and all of that. And just for my education, what is the 0.1% Ghana? I mean, 0 0.1 Ghana pesos per liter deducted from market margins on pre premium gas oil and LPG to serve as AOMC subscription for. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The AOMC stands for Association of Oil Marketing Companies. Now, they used to take the dues from their members directly, and then they engage management at the MPA to consider receiving the dues um, on behalf of the association. So we wrote to them and insisted that they should come by way of a resolution from their members at an annual general meeting. And they duly submitted it. They agreed on the amount, and that is exactly what the MPA does for them, free of charge. So there's no transaction fee charged by the MPA. The money is received and it is paid directly into the account of the Association of Oil Marketing Companies, I believe, for the benefit of their members. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. All right, my final question has to do with the operations of um, Metro Mass and um, the STC, especially to uh, distant communities. Uh, many uh, passengers from um, remote areas from Accra. But if you are there, Accra becomes a remote area. But I'm just saying, remote areas from Accra uh, have complained about sometimes the nature of buses that are put at their disposal uh, to transport them, given the fact that they trek long distances. Uh, it would have been taught that they will be given more comfortable and uh, newer versions of the buses that they have. But that is not the case. I will want to find out, I will want to find out what um, you will do to assist your um, minister to correct this uh, state of affairs. Uh, I have traveled with STC a couple of times. And sometimes the buses that are put on the Tamale Street, the Bulga Street, the Wa Street, the Hamile Street are not uh, the best. What will you do to assist your minister to correct that situation? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I believe that one of the ways that, um, not to dispute what the Honorable Member for Tamale North is saying, one of the ways that will give me a first-hand information is to also ride on one of the buses as a mystery shopper so to speak, to be able to get a first-hand feeling, then I can advise the minister 
if the committee gives me the nod, then remedial action can be taken as far as those are concerned. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. You may now have your follow-up. Thank you. Uh, well, I was going to ask a follow-up, but for once, Honorable Suhini is saying that I should let it go, so I will let it go. <laughs> for once. <laughs> Are you a royal? No, I am asking because of your hat. We've been educated in this committee to know that depending on the cup that... Uh, so I'm asking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I am. But this cup will not have any royal significance. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's nice to know about the different cultures in the country. So this is also um, a learning moment for all of us. Um, what is happening to the shipyard and dry dock? Is it operational? And if not, why not? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think that the term of shipyard and dry dock is by far the largest such, such facility between South Africa and I'm told Morocco, and it's, it's very important facility. Um, that would facilitate you know, marine transport uh, and, and make Ghana a very important uh, marine hub in the West African sub-region. Um, Mr. Chairman, the facility was privatized some time back, and I believe in 2012, the government bought back the shares from Penang, a Malaysian company. Uh, currently, it's being run by you know local folks. They have all the um, manpower, um, human resources to be able to do so. What they need now is the capital injection to be able to make it you know a very efficient facility. Uh, the minister is in town. He's on the uh, on the market looking for partners to 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 partner government to operate the facility. That is where uh, government stands currently. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Recently in the news, we heard of a cyber attack against a pipeline, an oil pipeline in the U.S., which disrupted their oil supply and created the queues at filling stations that are more associated with the third world than the U.S. We also have significant pipeline infrastructure. So what is the state of that infrastructure for the supply and movement of um, petroleum products in the country? And what is being done, if you know, to protect it against any um, cyber attack as happened in the U.S.? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I believe that um, in terms of pipeline infrastructure for the downstream petroleum in, uh, in industry especially, uh, which I can competently speak to, the major one that we have is the Tema uh, Mamiwata uh, pipeline in Kosombo. That's, that's operational, uh, recently been uh, rehabilitated by BOST. And then we have a 269-kilometer pipeline from Bupi to Bolgatanga with a booster station and uh, Savlugu, which is in between, that will boost the product products from Bupi to Boga. All these are in very good shape. And I believe the plans that are in place to get additional pipeline infrastructure would, would have to consider you know, some of these cyber attacks. And as you rightly mentioned, the existing ones would have to you know, be examined to consider any possibility of such cyber attacks in order to prevent them from happening. So the management of BOST, I believe, will take a cue and then um, the necessary action will be taken. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Well, we're working with the sector ministry and the agencies to protect that infrastructure because it is a critical national infrastructure. Absolutely. Um, how did you learn all the local languages on your CV? It seems mind-boggling to those of us who can only speak two. That you, you. <laughs> well, they say you are polygamous. Is it your? 
the women in your life who taught you the languages or it is because of anyway how did you learn all those languages Mr. Uh, for the records I'm not I'm not polygamous I'm potentially polygamous so there are two different things <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not polygamous, <laughs> but I'm sure my wife will not agree with me, even with the potential polygamous. So, Adia, please forgive me when we go home. So, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, to the question, I believe you can you can say uh, maybe um, the, the English word is polyglot. Polyglot, very well. Yeah, so I tend to learn languages wherever I find myself, whatever language that people speak, I'm interested in what they speak because I want to be able to understand who is insulting me and who is saying good things about me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you can say that um, also what you call in Ghanaian parlance a kubolo. A kubolo. So I go to every creek, wherever I find myself, I'm there. In so Nima, we could speak Hausa. So Hausa is like my first language. Um, growing up in Nima, and Ga was my second language. Before, uh, then three, uh, and then I learned to speak my language just like Honorable Muntaka. He is still in the early stages. <laughs> he's, he's in the early stages. And then I lived in Cape Coast where I worked for about two or so years, and that's where I learned Fanti. And, and, and I believe I find myself in the water region, I will probably learn to speak ever as well and in Zimai if I'm in Axim. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the Honorable Nominee is my former friend. And so I would like to ask if Mr. Chairman will permit five questions. My first question has to do with this uh, trot -tro transport business. Honorable nominee, as you know, the trot -tro transport business employs a lot of people in Ghana and it serves as the backbone of the urban transport system in Ghana. But that business is bedeviled with a lot of challenges. Most of the vehicles are old and in the updated state. Sometimes the insides are changed to economize space and maximize seating to the detriment of the comfort of the passengers. The destinations are not even displayed. And normally you see the mates leaning out of the right uh, side door to announce uh, the destination when the bus is approaching a stop. This leads to a lot of discomfort as passengers struggle to secure space in these buses. What do you think can be done to regularize the activities and to improve upon the comfort of passengers? Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, as I found out, the ministry is in very close um, contact with the road transport operators. Um, uh, GPRTU and the other road operators. And I believe this is a matter that can be tabled before you know the ministry by the road transport operators for consideration. Like I said, whilst government is looking at supporting and, re and, and beefing up the public sector transportation companies, I think similar arrangements should be made. We should give similar attention. I believe very strongly that the private sector does a lot more transport business than even those um, who are operating in the government sector. So supporting them would um, mean that you are supporting a larger majority of Ghanaians. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. But I'm not too sure whether uh, the Honorable Rikopoku is my former friend. As of this morning, I know you to be my friend. I don't know why you are disowning me publicly. <laughs> very well, uh, leader. Oh, I thought I saw your, all your hands were down, so I gave it to leader. Very well, you can take one each, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And good afternoon, Honorable Nominee. Congratulations on your appointment. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good. Mr. Nominee, 
There's been widespread reports credited to you for a solid performance at the MPA. At the MPA, how do you think that rule has prepared you for your new position? I have observed you here on this committee and I've seen your skills in mobilizing and seeing to the right thing being done. I've seen you several times prompting your colleague nominees to go around the, the, the table and bid us farewell. And that is very laudable. What are the skills that you will carry to your new portfolio so that at the end of your tenure, we'll have the same report that we have of you from the MPA? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, on the first day I assumed office at the National Petroleum Authority, my message to the staff was very simple. I'm not an expert to come and lead you and um, dictate to you. I'm here to work with you, and I'm here to take your counsel, and where appropriate we agree and where necessary we disagree. But we have to be working for the good of our, our people. I believe with that same attitude, I would support the Honorable Minister and the, um, the, the civil servants and my colleague, if, if, if we both get the nod to work at the ministry. I think the, it's all about having industrial harmony. Where there is peace, I believe we are able to work together. I also had the benefit of working with a very, um, let me say, thorough board. And one of the board members is here, um, is sitting here, the Honorable Ama Poma, uh, is a member of the board. And, and behind me, I have Nana Danka also, who incidentally is the uh, junior of the chairman of the committee. Nana Danka also was also there, and, and, and we work very closely together. It has to do with um, opinion access and collaboration. And I believe I will do the same at the Ministry of Transport. And I, I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My second and final question. Mr. Nomni, in the first quarter of 2021, we lost about 779 people through road accidents in this country. I don't have the data, and this according to the National Road Safety Authority. First quarter. I don't have the data for the second quarter, but I do have some data from my constituency. Only last Thursday, we lost a 29-year-old lactating mother on the Salaga Tamale Road, due mainly to some of the type of vehicle that my colleague and senior, Honorable um, Eric, alluded to. The vehicles that ply the Salaga Tamale Road are just not fit for purpose. To us in Salaga South constituency, road transport accident is becoming an, a pandemic, maybe worse than COVID. What will you do when you get the nod to work with the Road Safety Management Authority to ensure that our roads are safe, that um, the vehicles that carry passengers are safe, and the passengers will get home from home to their destinations? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think that the accident rates, uh, needless to say, is very, very alarming. And all of us, you know, um, are potential victims of some of these accidents because you have some people who would, would drive very tired. Uh, some would not even check their vehicles when they are going to drive. Uh, sometimes the road infrastructure is not, you know, up to scratch. And then the drivers are still speeding in some of these areas. So it's a multifaceted, you know, arrangement that will give us the necessary results. Uh, close collaboration with the National Road Safety Authority and the GPRTU so that as we examine the vehicles, we are examining the drivers, and the police MTTD would also be roped in in order to bring some sanity. Because uh, some of these accidents are one too many, and I believe a concerted effort is required to be able to deal with. Even the traditional authorities have a role to play at the various palaces, the religious you know, um, um, uh, churches, mosques, and so on and so forth. It should be a regular feature. There's a particular panelist on one of the radio stations. Anytime that he comes on, starts talking about road safety matters before he goes to. I think that some of the panelists on our radio TV stations should also make it a habit so that all together we'll be singing from the same hymn book. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a question on the aviation industry. Um, what is the government's post-COVID vision for the recovery of the aviation sector? Post-COVID recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I don't know the government's post-COVID vision ties in um, with the international aviation industry. As, as much as the international aviation industry picks up, the local industry will pick up. And um, if you recall, during the COVID period, the international domestic airlines were not even flying. Currently, I believe they are working almost daily, four or five flights and so on and so forth. They are reaching the point where we were before COVID. International flights have started coming into the country. Uh, only recently, United Airlines also started flying into the country. I believe the signal is right for a, a complete takeoff. We are not there yet, but I believe we will still get there. But the government's um, support for that industry, as I found out from the, from the ministry, is to continue to put in place all the necessary measures that will give confidence to passengers to realize that when you come to Ghana, uh, you are not likely to contract COVID on arrival or anywhere in the country. It ties in also with whatever measures that have been put in place generally across the country. And I, I believe the international community is responding. The passengers are coming in and we are also flying out. This will get better. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, the Jomahama led administration I'm just limited to that section. Minister, do you have a problem? <laughs> it's, it's credited for the largest infrastructural development in the aviation industry. And I think that is not disputed. Continue. Mr. Minister, your, your deputy is the one on the seat, not you. What plans does the government have to let me describe it, to sweat those assets to make sure that the most benefits are gotten from all that infrastructure development. And do you think that we are there yet or there's much more to do as additional businesses to support what has already been done? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I think that the, if you look at Article 37.5 of the Constitution, um, in terms of existing government uh, projects that should be continued as much as possible, this government is giving fidelity to that provision, in that pro um, projects that are ongoing would be continued, and the benefits that will yield to the country would come to us. And so it's on the basis of that one that government is continuing with the Kumasi, Tamale Airport, and then... Um, um, any other uh, airports that define, I think Sunyani is almost completed, Takradi um, airport, and, and so on and so forth. So, Mr. Chairman, um, the con ongoing work suggests to me that the government, you know, fully, you know, is in sync with the position that you have just espoused. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. My last question is on licensing. Um, a lot of people who are existing drivers or those who aspire to be drivers complain about the high cost of getting a license. And yet the legal requirement for a driver is to get a license. Is there a possibility of DVLA giving even a payment plan to somebody who says he wants, because you know, Ghana is hard, and for him to be able to get that chunk of money to get a license, if he could, he would have gotten them. Is there a possibility honorable, honorable that- Honorable member, how much did they say it cost them to get a license? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it depends. You get, there's a stage one, there's a stage two, and then you, you have to get the driving code from the driving well, school. After your question, I'll guide you outside how to get a license at the least cost. Mr. Chair, I've forgotten that you used to, you used to head DVLA. I shouldn't even be asking him this question. Thank you. Uh, I don't know where I'm you have.
thank you very much and congratulations, Hassan. Thank you very much. And um, are, you, are you aware of any development of a port at Impakadan by a private developer? Mr. Chairman, I am. I think it's the Ghana Post and Harbour Works Authority that is doing so in collaboration with the private partner. Uh, Thank would, you very much. Would you support that project? 100%, Mr. Chairman. 100%. Mr. Chairman, that's Thank you very much. Very well, Honorable Leader. I don't know why Champoli is laughing. They call me and then start. Why well, you are going to accuse me of conflict of interest? I have to disclose. The chairman is bailing me. He said that if there's someone to be accused, it should be the minority leader, not me. I wish you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Probably I was wrong. <laughs> very well. I don't remember. I have just a few questions. And it's, it relates to your CV. There are certain things in terms of your views. To, uh, I'm not sure. You say you're a director of TISA or TISA, Rural Bank, Kushegu, April 2012 to date. Are you still a director of the Rural Bank at Kushegu? Mr. Chairman, it will be rectified. I'm no longer there. You are no longer a member. So I'm no longer state a member. when you cease to be a member for our record. So. I will do the necessary correction, Mr. Chairman. Very well. And then did you say that in 2015, you were a partner in a law firm, 2015 to 2017. Mr. Chairman, that is so. How old were you at the bar in 2015? 2015, I was four years at the bar. Four oh, years? Yes. Um, but I was... You're still a junior. Senior. <laughs> yes, but uh, our records were, you were a junior, so... A partner. <laughs> a partnership of junior members. Very well. I thought that, yes, I thought that those things, the, 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 the records must, must be cleaned up. You are, you are practicing in that chamber. A partner, a senior, or a junior member being a partner is a, a bit... Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Very well. And then you said you are an associate of Benchiential Chair and Coma, June 2013. Were you an associate? Mr. Chairman. After my pupilage at Bentiential Lecha and Ankuma, I was hired as an associate to practice in the energy and natural resource team under um, the late Kojo Bentiential before I went to do my master's and returned to the same law firm to, to continue until I, I, I quit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the record reflect that you were hired as an associate. I think it's important that. Very well. Just one more correction. Three. There's only three is only one language I can. Asante tree, Fanti tree. Together a quapim tree. Together it's called Akan. So in it is important. I've corrected somebody before on this platform. For those who did uh, that language up to advanced level, you do Akan. And within the Akan, there's a Santi tree, there's a Kwapim tree, there's Fanti tree. So you learn to speak Akan with the various breakdowns. Very well, Mr. I think Chairman. it's important for the record. Very well, Mr. Chairman. Very well, well, thank you for attending upon the House, your own committee, to answer questions. You will come back now and join in uh, 
take the place of John Kuma so that he can also take his seat. You are discharged now. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm very grateful.